Hello everyone, today I'm working on a walk-in cooler. As you can see, we're at 75 Fahrenheit. All right, so like always, we're gonna pull up our troubleshooting chart. Uh, we're gonna follow the same steps. So first thing is our evaporator coil frozen. And then we're gonna check to make sure we have power on our solenoid. We're gonna make sure our evaporator fans are running. And then we're gonna go to our condensing unit. Once we're at the condensing unit, we're gonna make sure the compressor's running and that the coil is not dirty. And the final check will be our sight glass. All right, as you can see here, both the evaporator fans are running. Our evaporator coil is free of any ice or frosting. And we're gonna come over to our solenoid and test that really quickly. And you can see there, my tool's kind of uh, getting busted now, but yeah, we do have power at that solenoid. All right, next thing we're gonna do is check our condenser coil. It is water-cooled, so we don't have a condenser, but you can see our sight glass is low. All right, so we're gonna go ahead here and jump into our leak test. So before I throw gauges on, um, this is questionable here, it's leaking. So I wanna test that in case that is the leak. As you can see there, um, that O-ring's uh, no good anymore in that cap. We've changed that, we no longer have a leak, but our leak's bigger than this. So let's keep hunting here. So I don't really see any signs of oil per se. So let's just go ahead, take our time. So that's our water cooled condenser. We're gonna check all our usual suspects. So the flare fittings that are going into from the pressure switch. We're gonna take our time here. And bang, getting a hit right here, somewhere in the area of this pressure switch. And it looks like it's these uh, little capillary lines on the pressure switch is definitely leaking. It's that one of these two lines. And as you can see there, we had a rub out on the, this uh, capillary tube on the pressure switch, uh, which is unfortunate because this is an R22 system. So something that could have been simple, is gonna turn into an expensive repair. But let's see if it's high side or low side. So let's see if we can get a better shot here of the leak so that we can also send that to the customer if they request it. And look right there, you can see, zoom her in, look at that. Uh, we have a leak on the low pressure. So ideally we would like to pump down. Unfortunately, the high pressure side is on the other side of the receiver. So that means anything on this side, we can pump down. Anything on the other side, which is through this coil and there's our high pressure capillary tube, uh, we cannot pump down the system. All right, so let's come over to our refrigeration cycle chart. So we've added a pressure switch. So this line right here is the one that's leaking the low side. It is connected here to the compressor on the suction valve. Now our high side is connected to our water-cooled condenser. Now our high side of the pressure switch is hooked up right here at the water-cooled condenser. Okay, so if we're going to pump down, that means we're going to front seat this receiver valve all the refrigerant is going to pump out of here it's going to pump out of here it's going to pump out of here and it's going to pump out of here so that means we still have refrigerant in this entire section right here so that means we only have refrigerant in this section here well here's our high pressure capillary tube it's hooked up here it's in the section where we have refrigerant okay if this would have been hooked up somewhere here you know, we would've been good, we could've pumped down and made the repair. Unfortunately, we're gonna have to recover all the refrigerant. We don't have a choice. Now the leak is only on the capillary side of the low pressure switch, but if you look at the high pressure one, you saw almost an indentation. That is going to leak eventually. So this pressure switch actually looks pretty new. So whoever changed it, didn't separate the capillary tubes and we allowed a rub out to happen based on someone not being as thorough as maybe they should have been, uh, we've caused an expensive repair here. All right, so we're just gonna carry on with our leak test here. We're just gonna hit fast forward, okay? As you know, we, a lot of times we have leaks in this coil. We don't wanna go through this whole repair, quote the job, put the pressure switch in, and then see that we have another leak. So we're just gonna be thorough, do our due diligence. We do not have a leak at the coil. All right, so we're gonna move on to our leak test. You can see there I have my magnet on my solenoid so that we open up the entire system. Now we're going to back 
chance of this thing rubbing out of there. And we're all charged up. Our pressures are 56 and 206. And our current box temp is 40 Fahrenheit. All right, so let's go over to our PT chart. Let's figure out what our pressures need to be. Because we have a TXV, we're gonna take our current box temp and we're gonna subtract our EVAP TD, which is really gonna be determined by our superheat. So our current box temp was 40 Fahrenheit. We're gonna subtract our EVAP TD, which is 10 Fahrenheit, which gives us 30 Fahrenheit. 30 Fahrenheit gives us a 55 PSI. All right, and for our head pressure, okay, we're looking for anywhere from 100 to 105 Fahrenheit saturation temperature. Now, we can be a little bit lower than that, and it's not as critical on the system. Now, something with an ice machine, it's going to be more critical because we need our harvest temperature to get to a certain temperature. But usually, I aim for 100 to 105. You can even get away with 95. But in this case, it's 100 Fahrenheit to 105 Fahrenheit. And that would give us in the range of, let's say, 200 to 216. And we have 206, so we're within the range. And we have 56 PSI. We're looking for 55 PSI. So that means our pressures are within the range. We're good with our pressures. All right, so the last thing to do is we want to fine tune this. We want to put in a superheat. As you can see, they're filling up this box. They do not have time for me to adjust this superheat. Unfortunately, it is what it is. All right, so because they're adding load to the box, I can't really adjust this superheat. They keep opening and closing the door. They they need to get this cooler going. Uh, it's pretty critical for them. Uh, they don't have 30 minutes for me to dial this thing in, unfortunately. But I know we're, th we're within the range of the superheat. So let's just go over quickly how we're going to calculate our superheat. So to calculate our superheat, we're just going to take the temperature of the line, so line temp, and we're going to subtract our saturation suction temperature. So what's our line temp? Well, we can make an educated guess here and just take the box temperature and use that within one or two degrees. It's not the most accurate way, but it tells us if we're within the range. So our box temp was 40 Fahrenheit. Okay, we're gonna subtract that from our saturation suction temperature. Well, how do we determine that? Well, we have 56 PSI. So let's convert that, and as we did it earlier, that gives us 30 Fahrenheit. So if we subtract this, that gives us a 10 Fahrenheit superheat. Now it's gonna be within one or two degrees because I'm guesstimating the line temp. Obviously I wanna be more accurate and put a superheat clamp on that suction line, but in this case, we're getting pushed out the door here. But we can always use this calculation just to see if we need to dial things in. And this is also a good way to quickly calculate your superheat. Obviously we wanna put our clamps on, our gauges on, all that. But I always like to do this just really quickly you know, take your supply air and subtract it from our suction saturation temperature and it gives us a ballpark figure. So we couldn't adjust the superheat, unfortunately, but based on our calculation, we're definitely within the range. This thing's cooling down very quickly. We are good to go here.